they skipped over it? They skipped over the best part of Street Fighter's layout. <sighs> I've been summoned. One of my favorite esports channels on YouTube, the good old folks at Action Esports, did a video about the history of arcade sticks. And me being an authority in the arcade stick modding space, actively producing videos about the world of arcade sticks and arcade stick modding for competitive play, I felt like we should have a look at this video and see what these folks have to say. Our tale begins in 1967 when Ralph H. Baer, inventor of the Magnavox Odyssey, created the first video game joystick, which could control the position of a point of light displayed on a screen. Though not all that impressive, two years later, in 1969, the same year we walked on the moon, Sega released the first game that utilized this new joystick technology, Missile. The game featured a joystick used to control the flight path of the missile, either left or right, as well as a fire button to shoot the missile. In 1973, Taito released Astro Race, which featured a more complex joystick which had four directions rather than two. Now you could go left, right, and up and down. This is where it starts. For games like Pac-Man to be developed. Then, in 1975, Western Gun was released, which utilized an eight-way joystick, allowing for the cardinal directions to be inputted, plus one stop in between. Yeah. As the eight-way joystick will be vital for fight sticks down the road. Over the next 10 years, technology kept improving at a steady rate. The world would change in May 1984 with the release of Karate Champ. One of the first fighting games ever made, Karate Champ is credited with popularizing the one versus one fighting game genre. Though archaic in its use of two four-directional joysticks, Karate Champ was the first time that two players could set up next to each other and battle it out in a 2D fighting game. I've actually never seen any official cabinets for Karate Champ. Karate Champ is an important staple in fighting game design, but I've never actually seen any official cabinets for Karate Champ. It's interesting that they, that they use uh, multiple directions for both players, like having two individual joysticks to control a character. That's very interesting. I can't wait to see what they have to say about Street Fighter 1, though. That's what I'm really looking forward to. Other games would continue to iterate and experiment with the formula, but it was in 1987, with the release of Capcom Street Fighter, that everything would change. The game had a lot going for it. A diverse cast of characters, state-of-the-art graphics, and it introduced command inputs to perform special moves, like Ooh. doing a quarter circle to shoot a Hadouken. While the controls were clunky compared to later games, the core gameplay of Street Fighter is the template by which all other fighting games have been made. I don't know if y'all have ever actually played Street Fighter 1. The buffer for special moves in Street Fighter 1 is actually obscene. If you're a beginner struggling to do quarter circles or DPs in like Street Fighter 5, you don't even want to imagine what it's like in in Street Fighter 1. For the purpose of this video, Street Fighter's most important contribution to the fighting game genre was the standardization of its control scheme. One eight directional joystick, six buttons, three for punches, three for kicks. They skipped over it? They skipped over the best part of Street Fighter's layout. So yeah, Street Fighter did popularize the six button layout for modern fighting games. But what they didn't mention was that prior to that design, you had your joystick and you had a attack button. And depending on how hard that you hit that button on the cabinet would determine whether or not you got a light, a medium or a heavy attack like that was the attack system in street fighter one i'm so sad they didn't show that off because that is a gem of fighting game cabinet design but just because different arcade cabinets use the same button layout doesn't mean that all arcade cabinets feel the same a nope. fighting game player who frequented the arcades of akihabara in tokyo would have different expectations compared to a regular of the green arcade in seoul or a kid who hangs out at Chinatown Fair in New York City. Recipes Reason Green Arcade. Regions use different components in their machines. And today, thanks to our friends at Canadian Joysticks, we have these different components to show you. The first thing you ah. might notice is the different joystick shapes. Japanese cabinets have ball top joysticks, while Korean and American ones have bat top joysticks. And the reason for this goes beyond mere cosmetics. Japanese joysticks are designed to be used delicately with the fingertips resting on top of the ball. They use light springs to keep the stick centered without too much deflection and a square gate around the stick box to restrict how far you can go in any given direction. Because of this, 
users can manipulate the joystick with just a slight flick of the wrist, meticulously controlling their character in game. Arcade games designed for the more detail or oriented Japanese lovers tend to have a lot more variations in the type of motions that you will have in their games. So you'll see core circles, so you'll see DPs, you'll see half circles, you'll see core circle back, half circle forwards, you'll see double core circle forwards, you'll see pretzel inputs even. You'll see a whole wide variation of inputs for a game designed to be played with a Japanese lover because you can get a lot more particular with how you hit all of those directions on a defined gate with a easier to move joystick. And it is this iteration of the arcade stick lever that has become the de facto standard of modern fighting games. If you look at any modern fighting in-game controller out there, there's a very high likelihood that it is equipped with Japanese parts as a byproduct of this design. Korean and American joysticks are designed to be used with more power, and the bat top allows players to wrap their fingers around the joystick and generate force with their entire arm. American joysticks are ungated, meaning that the stick can travel much further than Japanese sticks, and they use slightly stiffer springs to help the stick snap back to center more quickly. Korean sticks are also ungated, but use rubber grommets to keep the stick centered rather than a spring, which allows their sticks to snap back to neutral even faster than American ones. One of the reasons why Korean levers are actually super popular for Tekken is because of that quick return to neutral and that excessive amount of force that you need in order to move it into its various different directions. Tekken has a lot of inputs and special moves that require for the stick to return to neutral before you input another direction. So when you see people trying to execute perfect electric wing god fists, or you see people trying to trying to KBD and are doing these like super quick and also forceful movements while also being able to like quickly release the stick and have it return directly to center. That is one of the things that a Korean lever can do with significantly less recoil than a than a Japanese lever. Because if you were to do the same on a Japanese lever and you bring it all over to one to one side of the gate and then you release it, you'll have a little, you'll have a bit of recoil back to the opposite direction as it passes through the center, which is not what you want because then you end up getting a separate input entirely. And that can mess up the flow if you're trying to execute some super high mobility options like Korean backdashing. So it's for that reason and why most standard fighting game players will typically opt for the, for the Japanese design, which is a lot more precise and a lot more minute. Whereas a lot of 3D fighter, game players and Tekken players especially will prioritize the traditional Korean design. Then there are buttons. If you're playing on a Japanese machine, the Sanwa or Samitsu buttons you're using are probably going to be flat or slightly convex. Here we have aftermark buttons, which are modeled after the American buttons manufactured by Hop. These are going to be concave and require you to push them a little bit further before they click. Some buttons are more sensitive than others, some are quieter, and the different types of plastic will feel different to your fingers. I feel like buttons are a very underrated aspect of fighting game design. Another thing that kind of builds on the trend of having buttons with different required tensions and a different amount of feel to them is the growing trend of arcade stick buttons that have mechanical keyboard switches in them. So that opens up the door to the entire world of mechanical key switches and the possibilities for different types of gameplay feel are near endless at that point. The term arcade perfect was coined to describe a game that had been perfectly ported from an arcade cabinet to a home console. That means one-to-one -one visuals, one-to-one -one audio, and one-to-one -one gameplay. Suffice to say, yep. for a long time, arcade perfect ports were nearly impossible to come by, so arcades were where hardcore gamers continued to flock. But that didn't stop game manufacturers from putting out some products that tried to mimic the arcade at home. Nintendo released the NES Advantage in 1987, the Neo Geo AES in 1990 came bundled with an arcade style controller, and Sega manufactured this cute little six button fight stick for the Dreamcast in 1998. I almost bought one of these. Desire for arcade adjacent setups on home consoles, but most of what was being made by big companies wasn't quite good enough. So what were professional players to do? Well build their own fight sticks. Yes. While today, you're able to hop online and order a Mad Cats, Razor, or Hitbox controller. In Let's go. <laughs> Back in the 90s and early 2000s, high quality controllers had to either be imported from overseas or built from scratch in your garage. Welcome to the ghetto build part one. 
I really need to make a video where I just make an arcade stick inside of a shoebox. If you want me to do an entire video about me building an entire arcade stick inside of a shoebox, let me know in the comments below and I will gladly do it. We had these uh, big old school joysticks that I uh, used to be able to buy in Southern California. Uh, they were called Ma sticks. Tao and Lin Yuan were the founders of multi arcade system joysticks, better known as Ma sticks. Working out of their garage, Tao Nguyen hand soldered every fight stick he built, meticulously creating console ready controllers that emulated that arcade perfect experience. As Nathaniel Chapman said in an interview with Kotaku, quote, Tao loved to talk with you while he was working. And in my experience, a lot of what he talked about was how shitty other controllers were. He was yeah. obsessed with quality. He hand soldered everything and had several consoles running by his workstation to test inputs before he gave you back your stick. And these mass sticks were heavy. They took up space. They had to be put on tables or floors because they were too heavy to lay on your lap. And by God, did fighting game players love them. Yeah, the, the story of Tao and the mass stick is such a powerful and compelling story. It was 2008 and coinciding with the release of Street Fighter 4, an unlikely hero would begin manufacturing top of the line fight sticks. Mad Cats. Mad Cats. Yeah, the company that made this. The company that made you dread going over to your cousin's house because they always made you use that one controller with the crazy analog stick. Uh... But when it came to fight sticks, they decided they weren't messing around. Signing a contract with Capcom, Mad Cats began producing the Street Fighter 4 Fight Stick Tournament Edition, better known as TE or TE1 for short. Yes. Using top of the line Sanwa parts, the TE1 holds up to this day for its durability and responsiveness. Since it was compatible with Sanwa parts, and because Mad Cats color coded all of their wiring and didn't require a soldering gun to switch out new parts, the controller was a modder's dream. You could replace the stick, the buttons, everything, and you didn't need technical knowledge to do so. This stick that you're seeing up there at the top of my shelf, that is a Mad Cats TE. So this is a Mad Cats TE that I received from one of my fellow players at the Ohio FGC, he gave me this bad boy for about 30 bucks. I mod this thing into a special arcade stick that I used in my first Evo. It was beautiful. It is still beautiful. I love it greatly. This is a very sturdy arca arcade stick. Uh, these these side panels are a, are a plastic. Uh, the base is a nice sturdy metal. The interior takes a little bit to work through. If you're just modding the buttons and the lever out of this thing, Pretty great, you'll love it. If you're trying to mess around and like like swap out the PCB, maybe you want to take out the default one and replace it with a universal uh, PCB e motherboard, then you're gonna run into a whole bunch of difficulties there. So modding that aspect of the T is a little bit tedious, but everything else, great. Gone were the days of attending tournaments with a screwdriver and soldering pen in case one of your buttons stopped working. The age of esports was upon us. But as younger players came into the scene, the perception of fight sticks being the only true way to play fighting games started to diminish. Players were winning Evos with PS1 controllers. Young guns like Punk and Sonic Fox were showing that gamepads could be used to immense success. Yep. And people were experimenting with new builds that totally changed the nature of the fight stick. One such example is the hitbox. The idea behind the hitbox is be the best for fighting games really felt that instead of using like a joystick, we wanted to use arcade buttons. You'd have better control over the directional inputs, which is really key for fighting games. Designed to be more ergonomic and responsive, the Hitbox offers an alternative way to play fighting games for those who are uncomfortable using the traditional joystick and button combo. I'm so glad they got this footage. Oh my God. Hitbox actually has photos of some of their legacy prototype models on their website, but it's in like the super small panoramic shot you can barely see. This is the best B-roll footage of those prototypes I have ever seen. I've always wanted to have a closer look at some of like the early revisions like the hitbox is built into wooden frames, inclusion of the plexi, the first all metal iterations. And then these, the early, early prototypes that they were showing up to, to majors with to kind of demo. Oh my God, they're so beautiful. It's nice, it's nice, to, it's nice that they showed that off because it allows you to see like the progression of the hitbox layout. From someone who plays on a hitbox, this stuff matters to me. And fight sticks are no longer confined to only 2D and 3D fighters. Some Smash players have been making the switch as well. Over the years, there were quite a few iterations of what a Smash fight stick might look like, but recently, a consensus has been reached. The Smashbox, 
developed by Hitbox, is the primary weapon of choice for most box players in Smash. Because Melee is an analog fighting game, there are way more possible inputs than most digital fighting games, so you might notice a few extra buttons. But at the end of the day, the classic arcade setup is evident even in the Smashbox. I've never seen these Smashbox prototypes before. What? So yeah, so we got the early uh, cardboard iterations. Some of the labels before the angle. Now they're angling the buttons a little bit. That looks really rough. <laughs> Getting closer to the final design. This design with the, let, let me pause this right here. This design for the Smashbox, this is like proto prototype cross up. And I think it's actually a pretty big reason as to why they were super devoted to getting the cross up to work with Smash. Just because their early Smashbox prototypes were super close to like working as like a smash controller with a with an arcade stick lever and four additional buttons to the standard layout that is very interesting today fight sticks can range from fifty dollars to five hundred dollars depending how much you want to flex on your opponent professional players mod the most minute details of their setups and fight stick enthusiasts take their craft very very seriously me as new innovations continue to come out there's no telling where fight sticks might go next but for a new generation raised on gamepads and PlayStation controllers, the arcade will continue to live on as long as fighting games are still played on a fight stick. All right, that was very cool. If you want to check out more stuff about arcade stick modding in your arcade stick modding space, if this video has got you interested in, in those things, I produce arcade stick videos on a regular basis with an emphasis on making the wide, wide world of arcade sticks a lot more accessible for people who, who are hoping to get into it. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in, be sure to like this video and also subscribe for more videos like it. If you want to know what some of the best arcade sticks to check out are, I have a video right here for you guys to check out. Also, make sure to check out the crew at Action Esports. They made a very fantastic video. Would be better if they interviewed me. My DMs are open. But overall, they did a fantastic job. Thank you guys so very much for tuning in. I've been John Pretzels, and as always, stay salty.